Today on the podcast, we are talking about the release of Tina's new book, Alone in the Midnight. Sorry, Alone in the Land of the Midnight Sun. So stay tuned. Hi, and welcome to the Christian Indie Writers Podcast, where we inform, encourage, and support Christian indie writers on their journey to publication. My name is Jamie Hirschberger, and I write short fiction under the pen name J.R. Nichols. I'm Jennifer Carl Tong, and I write historical Christian romance. I'm Christina Katane, and I write Christian dystopian fantasy. Well, I'm really sorry for yeah. wrecking the name of your book. Sorry, I just had to say that right <laughs> away. Like, you know, we were, like talking before and I was like totally off track and I'm really sorry. When I sat down to write a, a title that was so long, I ran the risk. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that, but I was so hooked on In the Land of the Midnight Sun. I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. This is why I love us. I mean, look at how how wonderfully all of this is being accommodated. And welcome to all of you who are listening live. Uh, I see Piper and Gigi and Liz. And Jen, help me with Love Qualified's first name. You're so good about remembering. Joan. Joan. Hey, Joan. How you doing? Um, It's good to see everybody here chatting live. And if you're able to catch us at 10 Eastern in... um, uh, our live chat, you should do so because there's lots of great, helpful, supportive community happening every Friday here on the Christian Indie Writers Podcast. Yep. And um, we also have Joy visiting with us and good Maria. Morning. So we, I can tell that there are more people that are lurking back there just listening, but go ahead and just throw a hi in there just so we know you're here and you can get to know each other. Yeah. And also we appreciate those of you who are unable to watch us live mm-hmm. or catch us live. So Um, If you're listening on any of the many platforms where we make the podcast available, welcome to you as well. And if you are watching us on YouTube, would you please hit the like and subscribe, share all of those buttons so that more people can discover the podcast and receive some of this encouragement and support. So um, Tina, I'm going to call on you to do your what's up first because the rest of the episode is probably going to be uh, very heavily, Tina. So give us a little taste of what we're about to get. Okay, well, I launched my book too in my series um, that I'm calling the Angelica series on Wednesday was my hard launch. And I Yay! actually, am, um, I just lost it. Oh, no, lost was your first book. I know. Yeah. Oh, I'm not helpful. <laughs> I had opened it up so I could read you guys the blurb, but, but then it disappeared. I must have touched my screen. Oh, we've got to. Okay. Well, in the meanwhile, I'm going to say hello to Teresa. We haven't seen Teresa and Tina, you're getting already a whole bunch of hoorays and uh, awesome for you. Thanks guys. Okay. So you want me to read the blurb? This is good. Yeah. Really that's, but first, what is in your, what does your shirt say? You'd rather be doing what? I'm sorry. It's called held in the grip of grace. Oh, I love it. I thought it said something like, I'd rather be doing something. That's awesome. That's even better. All right. So you're going to read us the blurb for your newly available book. Right. So it says, a daughter betrayed, a father kidnapped, a broken bond that could destroy everything. Angelica has always been a rule breaker. Now, with the New Testament restored, she struggles to understand some of the teachings of this man they call Jesus especially the one calling her to forgive the one man who has done the unforgivable, her father. But when the very militia that nearly took her took Angelica's life kidnaps her father, she discovers it might take far more than forgiveness to survive the mission God is now calling her on. With her own life in the balance, will her refusal to forgive also destroy the most precious to her, or will she find the strength to surrender her own will to that of the messiahs she's just met. Yay. So and exciting. Getting the blurb done is no small feat either. So congrats there. Well, I, think I have to thank a- the two of you for really helping me with that. Because I was just like, uh, I can't do it. 
Well, I congrats. Think, yeah, what, Jen? I think that blurb writing is can often be similar to even book covers. I think that like you that sometimes you can help someone else to figure out what's wrong with their cover or what's wrong with their blurb easier than you can look at it yourself, right? And so I think before I start this next series, I'm going to try to write the blurbs for all the books before I even start writing them and see if that helps me. And I saw somebody post in one of the groups I'm in that they actually write their book covers. I would make create their book covers or or commission them before they even write the book to make sure that when they're writing the book they're that they're keeping on track with with what their original like plan was. I'm like that's kind of genius. So I might try that too. So we'll see. I'll use that as my what's up. We'll just use that as my what's up. Oh, really? You didn't uh didn't really have uh what's up with for us, Jen? I mean, I, I could talk for hours about <laughs> nothing, right? We all know this. Like there's lots going on, but yeah, let's just talk about that like uh yeah i have a lot going on that i don't want to share yet because i really want to oh get, yeah um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know what to say because i have lots of things that i want to share but i'm waiting you're to doing get a all little the project you're doing I a little am. project yes i am so, writerly you, you said yeah. something about food earlier and then now you're not going to tell us what that's me that's that me who her. said that oh that's mm -hmm. you. I try, okay i try really hard not to talk about food on this episode because we don't get to be done until close to lunchtime and so i don't want to say you're hungry <laughs> oh you're not gonna so like me. You, you're not gonna like you my what's up All but right, i do yeah. uh want to take just a moment we are one podcast host short as mm -hmm. we have been for several weeks now and because uh we are not sure how much longer we're gonna have to be going on without the beautiful rhonda hagerman um, who writes under the pen name Dee Dee Bowman, just wanted to take a moment to fill everybody in that she is indeed experiencing some medical um, issues. So she has asked if everybody would please pray for her and for her family as she uh, works toward recovery. And if you care about, um, if you know Rhonda and you care to reach out to her, I'm sure she'd be more than happy to hear that you're praying for her um, mm -hmm. because I know we all are. But sometimes yeah. just somebody reaching out and saying it uh, in a personalized message really means a lot. So anyone who's got a lead on her social media or something like that, just let her know that we're all thinking about her and hoping she'll be back on the podcast soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my what's up that you guys were talking about. So I think that it's because of Tina's book launch and... Um, because when we had our retreat, I would love to bring something called strawberry pretzel salad that I got mm. completely in the mood for it. And I have some in the refrigerator waiting for me after mm. the podcast. I'm so excited to have it. So for those of you who don't know, which is what my real what's up is about, is like strawberry pretzel salad does not have any lettuce <laughs> mm. or tomatoes. And it's like this weird thing that I'm not, I'm sure maybe other cultures do, but especially Americans will pretty much call anything a salad. And so <laughs> I was like, why, why is this called a salad? And I decided that that would be my little life's goal to figure that out, to be my what's up today. Well, I happened to find the Buckhorn Inn, which is a restaurant and they have this, um, um, uh, little article that says the word salad comes from the ancient Latin word. You want to guess, Tina? Sal for, do you have any idea? No. You're, a Greek, you're a Greek girl. It's for salt. In ancient times, mm. salt was an important ingredient in dressing. You might be surprised to learn that ancient Romans and Greeks enjoyed raw vegetables with dressing. Typically, the vegetables would be dressed with vinegar, oil, herbs, and salt. Salata literally means salted herb. The dish became more complex over time. In the 1700s, chefs began to create composed salads with layers of ingredients. Now, if you ask me, it really does not explain how we now will eat marshmallows and mandarin oranges and, you know, Cool Whip and also call that salad, but there it is. Right. So the Great question, too, because like, I, is it an American thing or is it something that's international? Is it just a Midwest <laughs> thing? I mean, like Waldorf salad, isn't that what you call, we call it green stuff. The one that has like marshmallows and pineapple and pistachio pudding and Cool Whip and. We um, call it pistachio at our okay. house. 
Yeah, I think it's actually there's called... there's no good name for it. But Right. So when you say salad, I usually don't think about lettuce salad in, around here. Because like macaroni salad, potato salad, those don't have lettuce in them, right? Mm, so That's a really good point. I always thought it had something to do with little bits. Like if the stuff was torn up small, mm -hmm. that made it a salad. Like, I don't know. And Maria Johnson, our friend from across the pond, she's like strawberry pretzel salad, LOL. Which is even more hilarious because... Um, like, it's I like a gel salad, right? Like yeah. a jello kind of a and thing. This particular way that I make it, it has a pretzel crust. And then the middle layer is like a cream cheese reminiscent mixture. Mm. And then the top layer is um, strawberries encased in strawberry gelatin. So it's not even like a tossed salad, this particular dish, right. but people still call it strawberry pretzel salad. Um, someone in the comments, Liz, said she made a strawberry pretzel pie for Canada Day last year, which is probably exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm glad she brought that up because my family is Canadian. My like half of my family is from the South. The other half is from Canada. So like go figure how that worked out. But anyway, like all my Canadian family, when we would go to reunions, it was all these kind of salads. Not that you say that it was all either in jello molds or in bowls or so maybe it's not just American. So crazy. See, Jamie in Minnesota, that would be called bars. Because if it comes in a casserole dish and it's for dessert, it's bars. And if it's in a casserole <laughs> dish and it's for savory for dinner, it's a it's a pot, hot dish. Mm -hmm. Piper says that's ambrosia with the manner and oranges and whipped cream. Yes, I've heard it called that too. Yeah. Uh, there's also one that has um, cottage cheese in it, which you would think, ew, but it's delicious. It's sweet. That's the with, one I make. Yeah. Um, and then she says Waldorf salad doesn't have grapes and bits of nuts. It does have bits of nuts, though you don't have to do the bits of nuts. It has... Um, um, cherries, the dessert cherries. What are those called? Maraschino, Maraschino cherries in it, not grapes. Ugh. But grape salad is another thing that I love. It's just grape Yum. and um, nuts and like mayonnaise mixed with, uh, or is it sour cream? One of them mixed with cool, but it's a weird combination, mm -hmm. but in brown sugar, it's delicious. You made that for me once. That's so good. I saw somebody roast grapes with a little bit of olive oil, you know how you do the veggie treatment? They roasted them and then they put them on top of ricotta cheese oh. on a slice of toasted bread with walnuts. Oh my goodness. Okay, so now everybody's hungry for lunch. Mission accomplished. Except me, because I can't eat any of that stuff. Right? Well, you just had your brekkie. Good job, Bambina. Okay, this so. my breakfast coffee. That's all I do before the <laughs> podcast. I don't know why. It's just oh, mine's do. almost gone. Okay. So squirrel, um, we are ready now to transition. Re real quick. Uh, I yes. do want to hit some of our what's up, at least one yeah, yeah, in yeah. particular. Um, Joan says, what's up? My second contemporary Christian romance novel releases tomorrow. So I'm excited <gasps> for this episode. Oh, Congratulations, exciting. Joan. That's so we exciting. need to know your, your um, pen name so we can go check it out. Yeah. And is it a series, I wonder, or are they both standalones? Because that's interesting. Um, it's a great that you brought that comment up, Jen, because it does really help us tradition, transition, tradition, transition um, into Bambina's launch. So, um, Tina, mm -hmm. I lost my place. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> what? Okay. For, we, we already talked about what Angelica is doing in book two, but speak a little bit about book one and book two and kind of how they tie together. And then um, we're going to ask you about how you launched Lost. So okay. let's clarify about the two books. I'm going to try not to go back to the very beginning because I'm high context. And I want to tell you the whole story from the idea on up. But basically... Um, this is a post post apocalyptic book. So this is like 400 years after the apocalypse. The, the last Bible that was in existence got torn in half. They've re they've gone into the wilderness and have this village and they only have the old Testament. So they rebuild the tabernacle in the Alaskan wilderness and resume the sacrifices. And my main character is the high priest's daughter who, who never, who always messes up, never measures up and feels like God won't forgive her. And she gets sent by God on a mission to go find the lost new Testament and bring it back and restore it. Okay. So can you tell us, um, then book two without giving us any spoilers, obviously continues her story, right? Yes. So you've already been through a book launch once. What would you say? Okay. So how did you do that launch? That launch, I did an in-person um, book launch at a, 
people in a bookstore of a friend of ours. Um, and I was like, I had cake and I had drinks and we did a, like a hour of it was like online where you interviewed me. Um, but then people like my cousin drove from Indiana <laughs> for my book launch. It was kind of cool. Okay. So. And so then did you do really any marketing of the book? Did you do no. any? Mm -hmm. No. So you just basically had the launch party and yeah. I know you did enough. Uh, well, you got your book to number one, but that was all keyword. But that placement. was later. Okay. That's Cause I launched my book in November and I sold a lot of paperbacks at that launch party, but I, there was hardly anything on, on Amazon. All of my, most of my sales, except for a couple of them over since I launched book one have been on Amazon. So your entire launch strategy was basically the launch party for your first book. Yes. Okay. And so you obviously I didn't have a very good mailing list. Like I did okay. send stuff out to my mailing list, but there was like 150, 200 people on there. Like it, it was just mostly that, um, that launch party. Well, my next question was going to be like, so you changed some things. Why? But I guess we could say that you, you possibly weren't really satisfied with your, re your results. Right. I spent a lot of money on like cake and, and stuff like that and didn't really see a return on it. Um, although I did sell quite, I sold like 25 paperbacks that day at the launch party. Um, but like, as far as momentum, there was none. So, okay. And so you decided to make some changes. Yes, so did. this is where we kind of get into it. Um, what, what did you decide needed to happen differently? Um, and then like, so, so did you know something needed to be different, but you didn't know what or how, or did you already know, I knew I wanted to do X, Y, and Z, right? Yeah, I knew I didn't want to repeat the, the way I did it the first time. It was a lot of work, a lot of energy, and a lot of money for what I felt like was a little tiny splash on the day of, and then nothing until I released the audiobook in January. And mm -hmm. did some more, I did some marketing for that. And that mm -hmm. is what made book one go to number one in its categories. So okay. I knew, so I had that information in my head that it was the launch of my audiobook that kind of started some momentum going for book one. And so I decided that I didn't want to put any energy into an in-person launch. And I really didn't want to do like the whole um, Facebook live interview kind of thing. It just, I just had so much resistance to it. I don't have a really good reason other than like in my gut, I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that was me being a brat <laughs> or if that was instinct, but I just didn't want to do that. So. Well, and I remember when we were discussing planning this episode that you <clears throat> at this point started to hear um, like you're just paying attention to what goes on in the industry and you were um, recognizing that there's a faction of writers. They believe in waiting until like three books are out to do like any real marketing. Um, that was yeah. kind of like how Jen has been feeling about it too. Right. And so this yeah. kind of verbaling, I think is what drove you to just start working on book two instead of pursuing more marketing for book one. Correct. Right. Because if you were, if you had written just a standalone you might have worked harder at marketing it instead of right. getting on to the next book because now you've got this goal of promoting a series. Mm -hmm. And the strategy that I chose, I, I stumbled upon somebody else was talking about this specific strategy that they used. And it was um, specifically for a series that you haven't reached three or four books yet. And so you don't want to put as much time, money and energy into the launch as you would if you had that. Mm -hmm. And so it was a way of marketing of kind of giving a little bit of a bump to a, a book two release without a lot of the other stuff that you do when you have a big launch after you have a, like three or four books. 
I think it's important to stop here for just for a second too. And like, just point out like there'll be, there'll be people that are listening to this or watching this that have one book and only one book, or they don't write in series. And so what Tina is speaking specifically to is this is like the long haul, right? We're not mm -hmm. looking to, I think that a lot of times, especially when we're new writers or we have this idea that we want to be an author and we have one book that we're working on that we're going to release that book. And it's going to be this like, humongous, you know, all of a sudden we're an author and now we're making money. And often it's not, it's the long haul. So you release a book and maybe there aren't very many sparkles as you do that, but over 10 years time, as you keep releasing books, that one book will continue to make you money every single month. Right. And as right. you add books. So, right. Yeah. And that's kind of the, the that's kind of the strategy that I had, like give a little mm -hmm. bit of a bump to book two when it first comes out and then, I'm not going to do any more marketing, uh, even if I don't sell any books until book three comes out. Yeah, that was me. So that's my plan. Yeah. Okay. And so would you say it's fair to say that when you launch book two, you're, it's like a different ball game because what you really want, because, okay, you've got book two. Hey, everybody read this, but really they need to go and get book one. Right. So what you really want is it's people to start to read through your series. So you don't necessarily want to market this book as like a hooray standalone. You want to market it as the series. So right now so I, I didn't market it at all. Yes. Yeah, so let's get mm -hmm. into this strategy. So you were saying it's a two prong strategy yes. and um, tell us about this two prong strategy that you've implemented. Can we look at the just before yes. you move on? Yeah, so sure. sorry. Um, no, don't apologize. Speaking about Tina not wanting to do a Facebook Live or having changed things up, Piper says, maybe that was you playing to your strengths, Tina. You know what you are good at and less good at. Yeah. Maria commented on that. Yeah, exactly. It, I, it would be almost impossible to do all the marketing things. We have to choose the strategies and the platforms that work best for us. That's right. And um, or Maria says... I know I spend more on Twitter because I've built up that platform, but I would probably never go anywhere near TikTok, LOL, because I don't think the platform would be for me. And then Joan says, yeah, my plan is to be try organic methods of marketing until I've got all three books out my series, and then I can start looking at other stuff in uh, like Amazon ads. I think this is all good things to, to talk about that not only is Tina like talking about she's got this strategy, but she also, I think, I think. Piper is right, Tina, you're, you're going to work towards your strengths and someone else might do this differently, but this is, you're showing how you're doing it and then we'll just continue to follow it. So, all right. So your, your, your two prong strategy. Right. So my first prong in my strategy was all of my marketing effort went into book one. Mm -hmm. um, so, because I want to, you have really to, for book two to have, have the optimal experience, you need to have read book one first. You can read it by itself, but it's better if you read for book one first. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I did promo stack, newsletter promos, and I stacked them. So I started, I marked book one down to 99 cents, and I started on Monday, um, and I have it written down here, with a Faithful Reads promo newsletter, mm -hmm. newsletter promo. On Tuesday, I did Fussy Librarian. On Wednesday, I did Bargain Booksy. And on Thursday, I did Book Sends. And I had scheduled one for e-reader news for Friday, but I decided to cancel it. Okay, so pause right here. If you don't know what Tina is talking about, go and look up episode um, 172 or read the article that Jen put together for that episode entitled Book Marketing Strategies 2022. That will tell you what a free book C is, et cetera, and mm -hmm. what Tina is talking about. I think you would call that a promo stacking strategy, Tina. Yep. And so and I, just and all on book one. Yes. And just because you, you read it in that way, can I try to regroup it in a way that helps my brain? So you're saying that like in one week you had them scheduled for different days. Was that intentional instead of all yes. on the same day? So tell it me a little about absolutely that. Absolutely intentional. So that on Monday, people were getting their newsletter with my book in there with so they could possibly buy book one at 99 cents. And on Tuesday was a different newsletter, which went um, theoretically to a different group of people. I'm sure there's probably some overlap. Um, and then so book on Wednesday, then it went to out to a different newsletter. And on Thursday, a different newsletter so that 
people would see book one and buy book one with. And so this isn't results that I'm going to see this week because they're going to read. This is the hope that they'll read book one. They'll see that link in the back for book two and they'll click it to buy when they mm -hmm. see the link. Read book two now. Yes. Yeah, so we need to give them some time to do the reading. Right. But meanwhile, you should see a bump up of um, purchases or whatever of your book one. Right. Okay. That's really interesting. And plus, like you said, if there's overlap, um, that's going to be in front of a lot of people's eyes a lot of times. And we talked before about seven touches. Sometimes people need to hear the name of your book or the name of your author name or whatever seven times before it triggers them to actually make a purchase. So right. the overlap is actually a good thing for you. Yes. Okay. So anyway, keep going. Um, and so then I released book two on Wednesday. And the only thing I did um, for that was I sent it, I sent um, some segmented newsletters out to my mailing list, which is only like 780 people. So I don't have a huge mailing list. Um, and also I put, I announced it on like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. I think that's it. Okay. And that was intentional. So you didn't run any ads or promotions for book two. No. Okay. No. And so my hope is that the, the little bit of momentum will be continued because um, for one, I put book two into Kindle Unlimited. So there'll be page reads coming in as they read. And also, um, all the people that bought book one will see that there's a book two and hopefully buy it over time. So that's my hope. Okay. So, so that's a big difference from the last time we had a book launch was my book, correct? Or was it Tina's? No, it was my last was book, yours. correct? Yeah. And um, my goal with that book launch was I wanted to try to reach number one. And then right before we, we, I was launching, I realized how hard that was going to be and kind of was disappointed. And I actually ended up reaching number one in new Christian book releases, which I had not expected. Um, but to do that, I put the price down to 99 cents. Um, and I will not be doing that again because once I did that, I was like, okay, check that off my list, but it really didn't do much for my pocketbook. Correct. Mm -hmm. So now, so that you made that choice this time too, Tina, you did not reduce the price of book two for launch. I reduced it to two ninety nine. Okay, and and I told my newsletter subscribers, just for you guys, I have reduced the price to two ninety nine for a limited time, and at the end of that time, it's going to go up to four ninety nine. Because really, they're your only marketing. You're not lying. Yeah. Like anyone that goes on there can get it for two ninety nine, but you only marketed it to them. So I only yeah, I only totally told them to in that. my VIP group on Facebook and some mm -hmm. social media stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally fair to say that. Yeah. Okay. And so, um, are, are we ready to talk about the results or are you wanting to wait until you have some more input, input back or how are I you can, feeling about, I can yeah. tell you the results, um, that I had this week, which, you know, when you say it out loud, doesn't sound great. <laughs> um, but I, always, I keep having to remind myself, this is a long game. Right. And right. I'm looking. And so down the road, when I launch book three and then possibly a book four, um, these, these things should build on each other. Right. So I already told you that, um, on Monday I did a faithful reads newsletter promo. I had 21 sales on Monday from that promo for book one. Um, on Tuesday I did fussy librarian. I had nine sales. Um, Wednesday bargain booksy. I had six sales and Thursday book sends. I had six sales. So then this is something that I'm really going to have to sit down see what I paid for each of these newsletter promos mm -hmm. and see if it was worth the money and if I would do that again. Okay. The so hard thing, though, to say, though, is that even if you lost money, if they buy the second book, too, right. then you've made that's money. Not, not, that's not something that I can decide right now because I have to right. see, like, I have to watch it, like, six months out <laughs> and see, like, what kind of momentum it's built. Right. And I'm just asking again. So those are sales of book one at yes. 99 cents, right? Yes. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Um, so that was lost. I'm calling them lost and alone. So I don't have to say in the land of the midnight sun. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, alone on Monday, 
I had six sales. No, I didn't send any newsletter or any social media thing out until Wednesday. So because you did a soft launch, you didn't. Your did official launch, launch was Wednesday, but right. So these sales were probably my arc readers, ah. because I sent them a, a newsletter that said, um, "Here is the pages where you can go leave your reviews, and if you wouldn't mind, if you, I the books on, I marked it to ninety nine cents until the day of launch." So that my ARC readers could buy it at 99 cents just to make their reviews a verified purchase review. And you know how you can tell that because if you if any of them are verified purchase, then you know that they actually did that for you. So right. that's that's a great tip. You can absolutely reach out to your ARC team and ask them to buy at a reduced price because right. a lot of them will love you enough that they want to do that for you. Now, they may not, but that's OK. But it's it doesn't hurt to ask them if you do it at a reduced price. So that's a good tip, Tina. Right. And um, so Tuesday, Monday, I sold six. Tuesday, I sold five. Wednesday, I sold eight. And Thursday, I sold three of, of a loan. All right. I don't think that's too bad. When you've done nothing but reach out to your newsletter and that's about and, it. And it's kind of a small newsletter. And a lot of those newsletter subscribers, I segmented it. I segmented it with people that always open and people that don't open. So it was about 300 people that always open my emails mm -hmm. and 400 and something that don't. So those 400 something, I believe, are the people that I got through newsletter swaps where I was offering the book for free in a newsletter swap and um, or book promos on um, Story Origin. And they were just out for a free book. Hey, so. Tina, how many people did you sell to before it was actually launched, did you say? Um, 11. 11 before it was even launched that only three of those are your arc. I just went and looked. So again, there's something else we don't know. Like sometimes Amazon right. just throws us out in front of people to see for us to be able to like, you know, for them to be able to sell your books. So, right. And not only that, if they went to the alone page to purchase it right below that is this is part of a series mm -hmm. and here's book two. And it was marked down to 99 cents. Right. At that time. So that could be part of it too. Mm -hmm. So those numbers to me were, I was like, Oh, those are terrible, but I only need 25 books to hit number one. in my category. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so in my, I have like number eight strategic in my Clifton strengths. So my strategic brain is going well. If that, this is a smaller genre with less books written, but there's also less readers. Mm -hmm. And so if I keep it in perspective of what everyone else is doing. And I, so I went and looked at um, the releases, new releases and who was, and I was keeping track of who was in number one spot and all this. And it's a really a small pool that mm -hmm. I was swimming in. Um, so alone made it to number one new release. It kept popping in the new. There's this other book that was released and we were playing tag. We were like switching back and forth between and the number one spot for new releases. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Christian fantasy, I believe Kindle books or just plain books alone hit the number 10 at its highest spot. Very nice. On the top 100. Um, lost hit number four at its highest spot Very and they awesome. were in the top 50 the whole week. That's awesome. So both of them in all, I have three main categories, um, Christian fantasy, Kindle books, Christian fantasy books and Christian futuristic mm -hmm. fiction. So in all three of those categories, I was bouncing around and within the top 50 the whole week. And so that to me, I feel like I did what I wanted to do. So. I think that's great. And I think you're getting, you're getting some great comments too. And I know I'm missing a, a lot of them, but um, Joan says, I like your strategy, Tina, focusing on promoting book one and then hoping for the read throughs of book two. Um, Liz says, I'm afraid of losing money on ads. So my strategy is not to do anything. <laughs> and then she says, marketing for a series seems a bit easier than for standalones. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we, I would say, now this is, I don't speak for the Christian writers. I just speak for Jen. But I would say I wouldn't market unless I had more books out. It wouldn't financially, for me, it would not financially be feasible. And again, I don't want to speak too much on this because I am gathering data on what I'm my little secret project right now. And I will be getting back to y'all. But um, we have, we're going to have a future episode on, on this topic specifically soon. So 
Yes, um, but don't be discouraged from publishing if you only yes. have that one book. Please don't let it think you have to have a series. Um, Agreed. I think, yeah, I think I got myself into kind of a pickle when I started to see that the money is to be made in writing a series. And I don't think I really, I did not have it in me to write a series, but I've got a set of stories that I decided to like kind of cram into like a series. And my whole writing career is sort of backburnered right now anyway. But the bottom line is, I feel like I, I wish I would have had the confidence to just follow my own path and do my own thing from a long time ago. But, you know, this is just part of the fruit of going through everything that I've been through in my career to where mm -hmm. I finally can get to a place where it's like, I better do what I can do because there's only one me. And so don't feel like if you're not a series writer, there isn't hope or a path for you. It just happens to be factual that this is like, the way to make money as an author. Like this is right. the trail that has been blazed and this is how you get the outcome is, is to follow these steps. Am I, am I being clear? I would agree with all the, that statement. Yeah. I have a, a few more numbers to share with you guys. Um, page reads. Hmm. Now I, I will be honest and I have no idea how this works on the, on the page when you go in and look at your results, mm -hmm. like do they give you a sale and then add the page reads or do they, you not get, counted as a sale and you just get page reads like that's is, what i do you just get page reads it does not count as a sale but it will affect your your right. ranking on the top 100 so then those numbers where i had 11 before launch and 11 after launch mm -hmm. you have to add that to the 210 page reads that i had that's awesome since wednesday yeah. um so i made 50 dollars this week total um Probably if my books hadn't been marked down to 99 cents, that would be much higher. Um, I made $30.97 on a loan and $19.14 on loss. And of course, I still have, like, I think today I've already had 30 page reads. So. But you don't have a bunch of leftover cake. No, <laughs> right? I don't. <laughs> and all of your investment um, is like, you're going to still see it rolling in as right. opposed to the launch party that's one and done which maybe you got a little bit of word of mouth from those free, few people that showed up but this is going to keep working for you with sort of a snowball effect right. so it's overall yeah. a different strategy than before with a different outcome yeah, and I, I spent about the same amount of money on these newsletter promos as i did on that cake <laughs> i brought yeah. most, of the, most of the cake home with me and those sales didn't even count toward my Amazon ranking. So you know what? That's like an amazing budget, like benchmark. Everybody go to your local baker and pick out the most delicious cake that you would get if you were going to have everybody for a launch party. And if you want to have your party, have your party. If you're thinking maybe I'll spend this money on marketing, then spend it on marketing. What were we going to say? Piper sharing with us. Piper has a question. Tina, have you already used those newsletter promos for book one? How long ago? And did you do better that time? Yeah, so um, book one, I did a newsletter promo on the Fussy Librarian in January of this, is it this year? Mm -hmm. No, it was last year. And I hit number one in like 10 different categories. It was a little bit crazy. Um, and it also happened to coincide with the launch of the audiobook. Um, and then I, so I thought, well, it was at the audiobook or was it the newsletter? promo so i did it again in february and i hit number one again in february hmm. so right. and it was also the fussy librarian and then i did a um faithful reads one about six months ago and i don't remember how many sales i got off that one to throw my hat into the comments of this um i have used the same promos before um and they do not do as well the second time it was still worth it for me but i don't know that if i were to continue to do them on a regular basis if it would, if it would end up like being worth it. So, but there's lots of different ones out there to try and everyone's genre is different. Like mine is very, very competitive. So when I say I didn't do very well, like I might've done okay. Um, if I had been in a different genre, like as far as sales, but like I need a lot more to really see a bump for myself. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the strategy of just waiting, um, a certain amount of time. You know, I've heard of people, uh, every so often they put X book on sale for X amount and then they promote it because I guess their thought process is like bargain booksy or whoever is going to get new subscribers just right. like any other, um, 
business is going to. And so you can have success if you just put your books on, if you, if you're the kind of person who wants to put your books on, every six months, I'm putting this book on sale for 99 cents. And then I'm going to do this particular promo blast that works for some people. We um, are not claiming to have the only game in town. Right. Gigi asks, Tina is alone in the land of the midnight sun on audio yet. No, it is not. I, is I it am putting it on audio. But I don't have a time to, time frame for that. Are you using the same um, person that you the use? The same narrator. So mm -hmm. it's depending on whether she has time to do it quickly or if it's going to take her a little longer. Mm -hmm. Teresa says, but Aww. Tina, that party was special because it wasn't just a book launch. It helped launch you as an author. And I think that it's an important part of the process in building credibility, authority, and confidence. Yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. Like, we're not saying don't do a launch party. Like, no, nope. we're, we're saying that like, Tina just decided this time not to, and she's just comparing the two different approaches. My plan yeah. had always been when book four comes out to do a launch party then, but now I'm on fourth, the fourth book. And I'm like, I don't know if I really want to, <laughs> I love no. doing the online ones with Jamie. Maybe if I didn't have Jamie as my like interviewer, it may not be as fun and maybe I wouldn't enjoy it, but like, I don't know that I want to have it in person. So we'll see. So yeah, Piper gave Teresa heart for that comment. And I agree yeah. because Tina really was riding high that day. It was almost mm -hmm. like, uh, she was the bride at the wedding, you know, she was like, yeah. yes, I am an author. And it helped, I think with your imposter syndrome a little mm -hmm. bit too. And I was going to say, it's like something you can't really measure. It's mm -hmm. not measurable, but that I needed that day to say, this is real. I actually mm -hmm. did it. I actually finished it. And I'm not lying. <laughs> yes. And because um, it was 10 years, it was 10 yeah. years in the making and it was really an achievement. It was, it was not easy and you could have given up and you didn't. And so that whole celebration was absolutely worth it for sure. Yeah. Agreed. And the cake was delicious. It was really good. It was from the cake lady. <laughs> I'm not supposed to eat <laughs> cake and I ate it. <laughs> It was really good. All right. So do we want to transition now? Um, I'm actually excited about right, reading mine today. So yeah. Wow. Really cool. I'm, then I'm glad because I always pick on you to go first. So we're transitioning to the feeding of the backs. The what? Well, this is where we go around and give everybody only positive feedback. Why only positive feedback? Because we just wrote these. They are not edited and we're not really looking for any full on critique. This is just a sprint that we do to make sure that we're, first of all, writing something every week, because I don't know about y'all, but if it wasn't for this, I would not be doing any writing. So thank you for mm -hmm. being an anchor for me um, so that we are writing at least a little bit every week. And then we can share the results with everybody so everybody can understand that the world needs your voice as an author, because when all of us write to the same prompt and come up with such vastly different things, it hopefully is encouraging that perhaps your voice is needed too. Um, Amen. So Jen, I always all pick right. on you to go first. What's our prompt and what'd you write? So our prompt was, and now for something completely different, it is not in quotes, so you don't have to use it. It can be your title. It can be a topic. It can be just inspiration. And, and so it was kind of just inspiration for me. And, um, I hit my mind has been swirling around in this story for about a week now. Um, and I, I kind of need to write this for a reason that I'm not willing to, to share just yet, but I also, it's been something that has been requested from for a while now that, that I would write this from people that have emailed me, people on social media, people that have read my first book have been requesting this. So here we go. Elizabeth sat ramrod straight in her seat, praying that her physical appearance would somehow force her emotions to follow suit. It was a futile hope for never in her entire life had she been so unsettled by her circumstances. You look lovely tonight. The warm, rich baritone of the man she sat next to washed over her like warm, melted chocolate, softening the frozen cream of the exterior she fought so hard to maintain. She turned slightly and lifted her eyes to look at him. Winston Mallory. Never in her life did she ever believe she would find herself face to face with the man, let alone allow the man to court her. What had she been thinking? Looking at him now, she understood. She hadn't been thinking. She had been feeling. After all these years, he still had a hold over her that she couldn't deny, despite all he had done to her, all that she be had believed he had done to her. 
She was still in shock over the revelation that Winston had not caused her ruin. And as difficult as it was to believe that he had actually searched for her all these years, he had proven that fact by producing the bills for the detectives he had hired. With all that evidence, with the truth now exposed, she should be able to forgive him. But still. Do you remember that night we first saw one another across the theater? He asked. You sat there, looking every bit the beautiful apparition from my restless dreams, he said, pointing toward the box across the theater from where they now sat. Elizabeth remembered it well. The night, three, two, one. No, oh. it was just getting going. I know. <laughs> Wait, I no negative it. feedback. Sorry. <laughs> I know. That's how I was too. I, I wrote slowly. I, because I have been really marinating in this this area for a week now. But anyways, I'll stop. We should have said spoiler alert. But hopefully if you haven't read anything, you don't know anything, and you don't even right. know that that's just put this out of your mind if you haven't read any of Jen's books. But those of us who had are very, very excited to hear this story. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested, too, just to get to know uh, Mr. Winston more because he's only he's only like a dad. And, you know, with a with a impish, poorly behaving son. So we don't really get to know him. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, right. you know, as a child, you don't really know your parents. And so as the readers of the books to have to only see him through this dad lens, this is like really broadening the picture and is amazing. Yeah. All right. So uh, Jen Piper says that was intriguing. And Gigi says, Jennifer, so awesome. A cliffhanger. Liz said, I know those characters. <laughs> and Joan said, yay, loved revisiting these characters, loved them and searching for Anna. Very good. Yeah. When I first started getting emails from readers asking if I was writing their story next, I was like, no, like their story is done. You see them together. You just infer the rest of it. But um, and so I really hadn't thought about it. And then um, like as the years have passed, I'm like, like you said, Jamie, like, you know, he's just his dad. Well, no, he's not just his dad. He clearly was in love with her. There's all these little Easter eggs in the story in searching for Anna that I can now pull out and I can visit and I can like unfold into this. It will not be a full length novel. I don't think I, um, cause I don't have time for that. <laughs> like I seriously don't have time. This is going to be a little novella. I ain't got time for that. It's going to be a little novella. So well, and it's maybe a world that you can revisit when the sprint prompt sprint 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 prompt strikes you the right way. That's what I'm hoping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I've already got three requests for sto the story of the great catastrophe mm. this week. So mm. I might have to do something with that. Yeah. All right. Oh, no. I closed my window that had my sprint. Um, uh -oh. Somebody stall. Maybe talk about our writing sprint prompt book. Oh, why not? If you see it up here on display behind me, 30 Days of Writing Sprint Prompts. It is a, um, a workbook to help you get into the habit of writing every day with some little inspirational prompts that we have come up with. Also, some of them um, will have what we did with those prompts. So along with them, if you look at them, when you open up the book, you're going to see that they are the unedited version of what we did. So you hear us share this. Now you get to actually see these prompts and we tell you what episode we did that writing in so you can actually go back and watch us um, share them and get the feedback as well but we hope that that book it's um, we try to price it as reasonably as possible at $9.99 and we hope that the book will be something that you can use to just whenever you're kind of stalled like this I've been for a week thinking about these characters and what I'm going to do with them and it took a prompt for me to sit down and actually start to just kind of like you know blurt it out on the page and discover what the story is going to be. So you can also edit to your homeschool curriculum. If you hand it to your child and say, here, edit these pieces for these poor women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh dear. So, um, and now for something completely different. Yes. Thank you, Joe, uh, Maria Johnson for pointing out. It is a Monty Python reference. Um, I selected this prompt because Tina is doing something completely different for her launch this time. And I knew that this was a quasi famous, uh, expression. And so decided to write to that today. All right. So here's my take on, and now for something completely different. So this is my life now, Melinda thought watching the servers scurry back and forth across the alley, grabbing trays upon which they heaped plates of salads and cups of drinks. Calls of behind you and order up peppered the air. 
which was filled with the hum of the HVAC system that mercifully drowned out most of whatever that god-awful music was the dishwasher was playing. Melinda sighed and returned her focus to her trainer, who had left her standing there, impotently holding the appetizer sharing plates while she prepared the salads and scooped the coleslaw into little black dishes, which Melinda had noted with some amusement were referred to as boats by most of the kitchen staff. Mm -hmm. She couldn't wait to get on the phone with Clarice and tell her that if you ordered coleslaw at Billy's, you'd be brought an entire boat full of it. Ready? Her trainer asked, smiling only with her lips and teeth as she slid a hand under the overfilled tray and heaved. I can carry some of that, Melinda offered, but only half-heartedly, certain as she was that her offer of help would only be rejected as had been the 42 others she'd already made that evening. Hmm. I've got it, chirped the trainer. Behind you. Melinda followed the tall and slender form as it snaked expertly between the darting servers, most of whom had headed had heeded the warning that a wide load was coming through the kitchen and echoed the word corner when her trainer called it out as the duo rounded the corner into the dining room. Oh, excuse me, said a voice from Melinda's left. A customer had appeared from the adjoining hallway that led to the restrooms and had narrowly avoided a collision with Melinda. This was the reason every server was trained to call out corner when leaving the server alley via that particular exit. No worries, smiled Mel, separating her two side plates into either hand and waving them like marching band cymbals player showing off her readiness. I've got a light load. Not like your friend there, the customer said, gesturing toward the trainer, who was approaching the destination table and easing her tray down onto an empty one nearby. She's amazing, Melinda gushed for no reason whatsoever. Gotta keep up. See ya. She scurried over to the table and slid one side plate in front of each of the appetizer sharing duo and stepped to one side to watch her trainer take the order. It was more of the same thing she'd been witnessing for the past two and a half shifts. Rib dinners, grilled cheese sandwiches. Do you want a side with that? Blah, blah, blah. Melinda wondered when she would finally be able to do some of the talking, then felt color rise to her cheeks as she realized in a breathtaking moment of self-awareness that though she was the oldest employee working that evening, she was being treated like a child. Her mind flicked through memories of awards received and accolades earned in her previous incarnation as a high achieving career woman. And she wondered for not the first time how she had been brought to this moment. Time's ah, up. Love, love this character. First of all, your details. Like, I, I feel like I know what it's like to be a waitress now in a, and a, be trained by someone else. And I just love all that. And then this character, like, without telling us what's going on in their head, like, emotionally, you're showing us, right? Like, her opinion of the person, the things that she notices about the person, like, the person, how slender they are, probably tells us more about the character and her own personal, like, feelings about herself than really what she thinks about the other person. And so good. I loved everything about it, Jamie so well done. i appreciate that it was you really set the stage really well and then you totally hooked me with the she was the oldest one there being treated like a child right. and that she used to be a businesswoman and so now i'm like okay what catastrophe right happened in her life to get her here and want to keep reading right you I'm, swirl us into this world of this story of like being in a, a waitress and in the you know when really then then all of a sudden you bring us to like a, a tornado down to the bottom of it where really it's all about this person and how she ended up here and now we want more like we want to find out more about this person so thank yeah, you so jennifer good. for that visual that reminds me of a flushing toilet <laughs> Here. <laughs> that's awesome no i appreciate that i love fridays because i love the feeding of the backs so, because you guys have to be nice to me and give me words of affirmation give me more give me more but right, honestly, every other day of the week we don't have to be nice to her <laughs> so clearly it's a problem. i just we save it all up for friday <laughs> this ideal of writing in the restaurant world is appealing to me like no other recently but i'm not writing really at all so it's it just felt really good to like mm. do that um so i really appreciate that the, and you know um it's because i feel like i don't have time to do any writing that finally it's starting to feel like oh but when i can then the writing will will be for me instead of feeling like a job yeah. like it has for yeah. the longest time so it's really good that i'm starting to enjoy writing again awesome. so That's i appreciate so good to that. hear all right maria says smiling with her lips and teeth so evocative that phrase says so much agreed Liz says, ah, being the oldest, but treated like a child, heartbreaking. Piper says, Jamie, this is so good. You are such a phenomenal writer. Um, <laughs> Maria says, Jamie got to ask, 
<laughs> the salads mentioned involve jelly or pretzel. <laughs> Maybe some. <laughs> Gigi says, Jamie, I felt like I was in the restaurant. You are such a talented storyteller. I never want these sprints to end. Ah, uh, Melinda. Uh, agreed. Um, Piper says, yes, because I first thought she was a young chippy until you said she was the oldest one there. Yeah. So well yeah, done. Thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. Really appreciate that. All right. So Bambina, what did you do with, and now for something completely different. I decided to write something completely different Ooh. than ever, anything I ever wrote before. Well, very good. Very good. It's a totally different genre that I don't usually write in. So that's what I decided to do. Awesome. All right. For something different. The wind rushing across the prairie laid the tall grass down almost flat and caused Caroline's hair to whip out behind her. She'd long since quit trying to keep her tresses in place or a bonnet upon her head. It was a useless endeavor anyway. Hmm. Why was she out here on this God-forsaken piece of earth, battling with man and nature to try to grow a sad-looking crop in order not to starve? If she'd stayed back east... Caroline hesitated in her musings, shook her head at herself, and bent her back to hoe another row. If she'd stayed back, e back east, she would have aged out of the orphanage and either been turned out on the street or she couldn't bear to think of the alternative, so she didn't. She simply searched her mind for a song to ease the work. Hmm. Count your blessings, name them one by one. I'm don't, I don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that is the song that would come to mind. And though she knew her blessings were many, however much she wished for different ones, she mustn't scorn the fact that the stranger she'd married, sight unseen, and followed out to this godforsaken place was at least kind, gentle, hardworking, and immune to the bottle. A bit over-religious for her taste, but he didn't force it upon her to his credit. As if on cue, James emerged from the barn, looking up at the sky while he wiped his brow on his sleeve, then turned to come her way. Startled, she realized he was running and shouting something, though the wind stole the words away before they could reach her ears. He was pointing to the eastern sky, and when Carolyn turned to look, she saw it, a dark cone of cloud, twisting oh. as if it had an unquenchable need for vengeance, throwing debris into the air and heading straight for her. Caroline stood, frozen, as she watched what looked to her like the finger of God coming for her to mete out the wages of her sin. James Ooh. grabbed her by the arm. She only stared at him, unable to move or comprehend the words he was shouting. Then he lifted her into his arms and ran toward the house. The words he was saying, saying finally reached her ears. Please, God. Please, God. Please, God. Three, two, one. Oh, oh so good, because you hint that she's, like, lacking in faith or something, and then, like... It's God coming for me because like that was really, really powerful. Yeah. yeah very good. And like, so like the, so funny that we, that we talked about tornadoes a second ago and like you wrote about tornadoes, but that's so <laughs> funny. But um, the fact that like you made the tornado, the finger of God, the hand, like, I just think that was just so well done. Like, I really love that. It makes me want to know more about this character and why does she think that? Why, why would that be her first thought? You know? So. Yes. Piper says, Oh my gosh, this is so good. And also Piper says vengeance, the finger of God coming for her. Oh my goodness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Same imagery. T uh, Tina, that was very provocative because me too, Jen. Right. Um, this does the same thing too. She loved the description of the tornado being the finger of God. Yeah. Maria yeah. says, Oh, so good. Tina, uh, Joan says, wow, that was so good. Tina, so intriguing. I was invested in this character and made me want to read more. Gigi, Tina, your details about the wind laying and the progress over and the hair whipping. So good. Left me on the edge of my seat. Wow. Yeah. And I love too what you revealed about this person and her relationship with her spouse. Um, in just a very few words, there's a whole story there, but, but you didn't, you didn't belabor it to where it felt info dumpy. You just said, you know, the man she'd married sight unseen, a little too religious for her taste, but at least he didn't push it on her to his credit. Like, I mean, that was enough mm -hmm. to totally tell you everything without feeling like, well, here's the prerequisite backstory. It was very expertly done. That was really Thank good. You. Yeah, I love it. I want, I kind of want you to write this as a romance now. Yeah, it's not really my genre, but... Uh... I want to know. I, fun. I always wanted to write a mail order bride uh, story, which I probably will eventually just because, you know, it's back there percolating. But yeah, that's so good. It would and take I, a lot of research because I don't know a ton about it. I just have read a few things. Right. 
that's awesome. All right. We lost Jamie. We were afraid that was going to happen, but that's okay. We'll just kind of move on. I know her what's next is just to keep chugging along and what she's doing. But uh, Tina, what is your what's next? We know what happened this week for you with your release. So now what are you going to, what happens next? Book three. Got to write it. I, have you started writing it? Yes, I have. Oh, yep. and how's that going? It's going good. Like, okay. So well, a year ago, I started writing it. I like did all the background for the characters because I do a lot of character development. I mm-hmm. don't necessarily do an outline, but I do do a lot of character development. Mm-hmm. And I actually wrote, um, I don't know, quite a few scenes. But then a year went by and I went back and looked at it and I started writing the, like I still, I'm keeping the character development and that, but like, I feel like I'm a different writer now. It's just, mm. and oh, so yeah. I just started over. Oh, that's but it's okay. really fresh and exciting and I'm really loving what I've written so far. So. Oh, that's so good to hear. Like how, like I, it's so sad to me whenever I hear an author talking about what they're working on and it just to be a drudgery, you know, like yeah. editing, I get it. Editing is going to be a drudgery and there's certain parts that are going to be like, Ugh. but the writing, like the writing should be exciting. Right. So I'm so right. happy to hear that from you. And I did a lot of, um, I did a lot of research, which really made my learner happy mm-hmm. and uh, about earthquakes and volcanoes and the ring of fire. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's yeah, awesome. That's a little tent. Well, my what's next is I have started round two edits on book four. Um, I was struggling with that last second to last chapter. Um, and I've kind of just like put it to the side because I'm hoping that as I go through the second round, I'll have a clearer kind of image of what I want to happen in that chapter. So it's just going to be a different kind of editing, but I'm going, I feel like I just need to go back and do second rounds. So that's what I'm doing right now, which for me, second rounds is taking what I've written and putting it over into Microsoft Word so that it can read it to me. There's other ways that you can do that, but, um, that's what I'm going to do. And, um, I'm already, um, finding lots of things I'm changing. And I don't know, again, like you said, you're a different writer. I don't know if I'm just being a perfectionist or what, but they're like, I feel like I'm changing a lot more in the second rounds than I did with my first couple of books. So we shall see, but well, that's it's also getting there. The first book you wrote, right? No, like, it's, it's, no, it? this okay. is like the most recent book I wrote. So the, and this oh. will be, yeah, this is book four with um, Sarah. So um, yeah, but I was I'm, just listening to a Joanna Penn um at podcast last night where she had an editor on there and she's also a writer and she said i thought that since i was an editor um i could skip the part about having it read back to me by somebody or like, i heard i, well, I heard that said that she went to do the audio uh-huh. for one of her books and she realized how wrong she was right I, yeah. I know. So the next stage after i have it read to me by the computer is i sit down i read out loud um, and it makes a huge difference. And so I used to read out loud to my husband, um, just because of his work schedule that worked out. I, I, and then the last time I just read it out loud, I think I'm going to record it this time, not to use it for audio because I just don't have that talent. Um, but read it out loud so that I can listen to it again. So yeah, I, I do, I have about two or three more stages left, but really at this point it starts going faster because it's really just tweaking at this point, but yeah. Piper says her what's next writing more in work in progress. Um, going to see the blue man group this week and how, how exciting Maria says her what's next carrying on editing book four. Haven't done Facebook ads for book one in a while. So going to plan to run one this week. Also, I might try a few sprints as I get, can get a bit bogged down in editing. Yeah. That's, this has been helpful for me to be able to write in other worlds. But the problem is, is I've been writing so much in my Widows of the West series that I'm like, just want to be over there. Like, I want to be done with this series so I can get over there. So, yeah. Uh, Joan says, what's next? I'll be hosting a virtual book launch party on my YouTube channel tomorrow. So I'm going to be fi- finalizing details today. That's awesome. Uh, Joan, tell us in the chat when that's going to be. Uh, Liz says, good luck to you. Um, so, yeah. So that's what's coming up for us. Um Next week, we don't have a podcast. For those of you that uh, tune in faithfully every Friday, if you are in the United States, you will be celebrating Memorial Day weekend next weekend. And here in the United States, Memorial Day is a day for us to remember those who have fought for our freedoms and have fallen or have gone on before us. Um, And it used to be called Decoration Day. If you read um, uh, uh, Calling for Phoebe, they actually celebrate Decoration Day in one of the chapters. Um, but we celebrate it here now call it and call it, um, Memorial day. It's also, um, more, more 
tends to be this coming weekend is a time for us to step back from our normal lives and maybe either get away with a family like or just spend time at home with our families and and just to kind of remember that like to be able to celebrate our freedoms. So we will yeah. not be doing a podcast next Friday because we have things we would like to do with our families. So we will miss you guys, but I hope that you guys can all appreciate the time that we want to take with our families. Yeah. So. That's, I'm looking forward to it. We're all going out to the campground. My 12 week pregnant daughter, hopefully she won't be puking everywhere. Right. Is she <laughs> staying in the camper with you? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So in the glamper. We have room in the living room in our glamper for a, a queen size air mattress. So that's awesome. She's staying in there. All right. Well, we appreciate everyone who's been here today and we appreciate everyone who shows up every week. And so until next time, not next week, but until next time, may your pen be prolific. May your deadlines be met and may all of your words honor Christ. Bye now. Bye.